Well, this led to another job during the uh, school year. That was a summer job. And during the school year, I met this old lady and this old man who had, you know where the uh, Corville Dam is now? Mm -hmm. Well, before the dam was built, they bought all, the government bought all that land that would be underwater or close to being underwater. And they rented it out in, I think it was 600 acre plots. And this elderly couple, they had a lot of cattle and horses and they rented two of those together and they had all kinds of cattle and horses out there. And this is, this is the mule story. And I sorely wish I had never told this story because everybody makes me do it over and over again. <laughs> uh, my job on Saturday mornings was to go out to this 1,200 acres and catch whatever I could catch out there and ride over the whole place and count cattle and horses and the ones that were supposed to have calves and did or didn't and on and what on. I made a list. Well, about a month before this particular time that I went out there, I went to the Kelowna horse sale down in Kelowna, and I moved at the wrong time, and my hand went up when I meant to scratch my head, but the auctioneer thought I was buying whatever this was. Well, it turned out to be this mule. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, I tried to get out of it, but I couldn't. I owned this mule, whether you like it or not. It, you know, it was too far gone, and they, they were already selling the next thing, and I hadn't realized it, and then all of a sudden they said, you bought that mule, past tense. <laughs> so I had, I had, I owned this mule, and this mule was the homeliest mule you have ever seen in your life. Its mother, it turns out, was a racehorse, a, a, a thoroughbred, which are long-geared, tall, my gosh, it took a step ladder to get up on that stupid thing. And the homeliest thing, it, it, it looked like a big old claw hammer when you're sitting there stand, standing there next to him. And I think it took about 10 minutes to walk around him, he was so long. I'm sure that mule had about three or four extra vertebrae, and a long neck. And his head, I had to make a bridle for that mule. You couldn't buy one that would fit him. His head was too long. And this is not a truck driver story. You, you know the difference between a truck driver story and a, a, a fairy tale? Well, a fairy tale starts out with once upon a time. And a, a, a truck driver story, it starts out says, this ain't no bull, man, but they add a little bit to this. Yeah, well, really. this ain't no truck driver story. Uh, I got, took a measuring tape and I measured this mule's ears and they were in fact three feet long. <laughs> three feet and he, he somehow didn't have control of them. You know how <laughs> most mules they stick them forward, they look kind of nice, they're looking or else they stick them back and that means they're mad. You know this they just hung out there. <laughs> like a, the, the thing looked like a taxi cab going down the street with his doors open. Just big old three foot ears hanging out there and his long neck. And when he brayed, he, he curled his lips up and his teeth hung out. Boy, that mule had some teeth about this. Well, I think he could eat corn on a cob through a picket fence. His teeth were so big. And a broom tail. You know, normally a horse raises his tail and shoes flies, and it's kind of pretty. The tail hairs hang off, and it's graceful. Well, this mule had hairs that just stuck out like a broom. <laughs> And when he raised his tail, it looked like they were fixed. It looked like a garage door went up. <laughs> it was awful. This meal was just ugly. And tall? Well, I, I went out there this day to catch whatever I could catch to, to ride over this 1,200 acres to find, count heads and all this stuff. Well, the only thing I could catch was this mule. Yeah. So I, I had the bridle in my in the pickup truck there, and I put the bridle on the mule, and I rode all over the place and counted heads. Well, this went on for, I don't know, three or four weeks, and the fourth time or so that I went out there, I took this little kid from the neighbors who was from, uh, I think, in England or, or maybe Ireland, I don't know. I didn't pay any attention, but... He was about seven or eight, just a little kid, you know, a little, he way smaller than this guy. And uh, we went through the gate, parked the truck on the, on the road, and opened the gate and went on in. And I told him, I'm going to get this mule, or whatever I could, and what turned out to be the mule. And <clears throat> he, he jumped up there with me, got on a stump, and I reached down and pulled him up, and we went off. 
to count all these horses and cows. Well, this kid was not a very experienced farm boy. He was from like London or Dublin or some big city over there, I don't know where. He didn't shut the gate. So when we got back up there, we counted all the cows, and then there were several horses missing. There were about a half a dozen or more missing. So we got back up there to the gate, and the gate's wide open. Here they were down the road. They had gotten out. And so I, he said something like, oh, I didn't know. No, he, didn't. he gave me this big excuse. Well, I told him, you get off here, and you stand up here on the road. And when I'm going to go down there and shoo them up here, and you make sure they go in the gate instead of going past the gate down the road. So he did pretty good, pretty well at that. So I started down the road on this, this crazy mule, and the, the horses saw me coming, of course. Of course, you know, off they go at a dead run, the wrong direction. So I goosed that mule in the butt, and whoa, off she took like a, a scalded dog. That's the fastest animal I ever rode in my life. And stuck his head out, and his ears are just a-going, <laughs> and his teeth, and he's braying. Whoa, just braying all the way down there. And boy, I was holding on to dear life because I just thought if I just turn loose of his mane, you know, I'm going to be dumped because boy, that thing was fast. We passed those horses up in like seconds. And I stopped, turned him around. He turned like a, on a dime with a dime, a nine cents change and ran those horses back up there and little kids doing this, you know. And they went back in the gate and everything was hunky-dory. We all lived happily ever after. So I got to thinking, you know, when there was a horse show in Iowa City every, every summer about June or July, I don't remember. And I, uh, they had this race, and, and in the, they had the, a big show ring, you know, a, a, a big oval-shaped ring where the horses went in and rode around the ring, and in the center of the ring was this elevated stand with the organ and the guy with the microphone, a little roof over it, you know, and some flags all around like, like a political grandstand or whatever. And so, at the far end, they'd open that up, and you'd start on each side of that grandstand and run down there an eighth of a mile and around a numbered barrel and come back an eighth of a mile, and whoever got back first won that race. It was 100 bucks. And I was like 14. <clears throat> That's like 100 years ago. <laughs> Give or take. 100 bucks to back in those days was big bucks. That'd be like close to a thousand dollars to us today. That was big bucks. So I thought, I'm putting this mule in that race. <laughs> so me and the, my neighbors, kids, and my buddies that all had horses, we got to practicing for this race. And we set up out in which one kid's farm, we set up a regular thing to do it and you know, barrels and all this stuff. And this one kid had a flare gun that popped these big old ugly flares. And it made an awful noise. It sounded like a cannon when it went off. And he had a, a megaphone, a little handheld megaphone, and it sounded just like that guy at the horse show. He'd say on this megaphone, hang your mark, get him up, line him up, get him. And that mule got used to this, you know, and then he'd pop that thing and it'd make an awful noise. And there was about a half a dozen of it. And that mule got to thinking. <laughs> with that big, long, ugly head. And he'd kind of half squat down like a dog sits down, about halfway, and he'd stick his head way out there and his ears would be going, and he'd start a flopping his tail, and his tail's already on the ground, you know, and it's making dust, and he'd stick his head out there and start braying. Oh, just terrible. It sounded like, it sounded like an, a mad bull, you know, and all the rest of the horses would jump around trying to figure out well, what all that commotion is. When that thing went off, boom, Whoa! He was about four lengths ahead of the rest of those guys, stuck his head out and braying all the way down there. Whoa! <laughs> we get down around our barrel, and we're halfway back, and the rest of them are just coming down. And we come to a big screech and hauled up there at the end, and, and boy, it worked perfectly. Well, I won that race in, the, in, the, in Iowa City at that horse world three years in a row. Three years. The fourth year, finally, uh, a bunch of these guys from Oklahoma and Kansas, and I think there were some from the Panhandle of Texas, they came up there with all those real expensive quarter horses. And back in those days, these were like $20,000 animals today, but back then they were like three and four and five thousand dollars a head, you know. And they had been through all these training camps and all this crap they put horses through, you know. So here it comes, there's about 15 of them. 
There's about seven or eight of us on each side of that grandstand. And the guy does this thing, you know, and you're right, and the old mule squatting down, the tails are going, the teeth are hanging, he's whoa, making all this racket. And all these quarter horses are dancing around trying to figure out what's all that commotion. In the meantime, boom, off, off he goes, whoa, he's braying all the way down there. And we got down around our barrel, come scalding back like a scalded dog, and come screeching all up at the top, at the end there, next to the grandstand. And the guy's talking on a microphone, well, boy, that mule sure is fast. And everybody's hearing that on the loudspeaker. And here comes the rest of them, come to a screeching halt, and this guy with this real expensive horse and his big 10-gallon hat and all that drugstore cowboy paraphernalia, he's wearing <laughs> shiny boots and all, and all I had was an army cell. <laughs> he comes up there and he says, I want to know just who in the <laughs> heck won that race. He was real foul mouth right out in front of God and everybody, you know. And the guy on the microphone, you could hear him all in the loudspeakers. And the guy says, well, that young man won that race. And he says, well, you mean and you, let, you let a mule in this race? I brought this quarter horse from Oklahoma or wherever it was he's from, Texas. I paid $3,000 for this horse. And he says, well, now, just a minute, sir, just a minute. Young man, come over here. And I rode that mule over to the edge, and he stuck the microphone. First he asked, how much you pay for that mule? And I told him how much I paid for it. $13. <laughs> the crowd just roared. He took his hat off and slammed it on the ground and rode off. Well, I picked his hat up. It was all I could do to reach down there and get it. Picked his hat off and put it on it. fit perfectly. I could have rode off that hat, but I didn't. I took it over to him, and he wouldn't even look at me. He just grabbed the hat and turned around and walked off. He was really mad. Well, then, that summer, that stupid mule died. But, no, wait, that was the following summer. That was, uh, like, August or July, and that winter, he did me another number. I had bought a... Uh, a wicker buggy. You know what a wicker buggy is? You know what a wicker basket is? Yeah. Yeah. It's a woven basket. Well, this buggy, they used to make buggies like that. A wicker buggy. Boy, if you could find one today, I'll bet you'd pay 5000 or better for it. It'd be really expensive. I got one for 300 bucks or 400 something like that, 300 or $400. And I found a set of runners where you could pull the wheels off and slide these runners on, just tighten them down. In about five minutes, you had a sleigh. So it snowed really pretty like it is today, and I, me and another fellow, we were going to pick up our two girlfriends and go sleigh riding. So I had to go out in the country and pick them up. And I was going out highway one, just going like heck. The only thing I could catch was that stupid mule. And I, I, taught, I just prayed he wouldn't start braying. That would be so embarrassing with a girl in there. So, but he was going okay. And along comes, on Highway 1, here comes one of those Ruan gas trucks with the horns on the roof. Uh -oh. And I didn't, you know, I just saw a truck, whatever. Didn't think anything of it. Just as he gets right next to me, he blows those horns. Uh -huh. Woo! Off he went like a scalded dog. Well, the road turned left and he went straight. <laughs> went in, went through a board fence, kicked it all to heck, tore the buggy all to heck. Of course, I jumped out. I wasn't going to ride through that. Then he went into a field that had been trees and it was all stumps about this high. When he got to the other end, there was nothing left of that buggy. It was totally wrecked. My beautiful runners in shreds and pieces and the buggy was all over the place. Gone. Well, that some, the following spring, we found him dead. This stupid thing died. He, got, he went out there and got something in his system that plugged up his urinary tract, and apparently he died from uremic poisoning, and that was the end of him. But I won 300 bucks with that mule, but that did not pay for that wicker buggy and those runners. No. <laughs> so I lost probably 150 bucks in that deal. That was, so that's the mule story.